Hi there. This is the um, Daroga video about pelvic mass assessment and management. I must admit I took a little Daroga break and you see here the beautiful red center. Um, almost a gorge worthwhile visiting if you want to relax and unwind. But when I came back I noticed as per today I've produced 22 different videos and to my pleasant surprise we have achieved more than 10,000 views now and 96 subscribers. So that inspired Jimmy and myself to continue. A pelvic mass. It appears to be quite daunting but what I would like to achieve today is to inform you about the clinical assessment and how to use a simple assessment tool which will probably help you preparing for your exams including OSCEs but also when you do your clinical assessment as a junior doctor. You might have feel a bit like this but don't worry I'll try to help you. The overview of my lecture of the day is first we will discuss the differential diagnosis which is quite extensive then I'll present management options and important discriminator is whether a lady a woman presents with acute symptoms or she has no minimal has no symptoms or minimal symptoms or sometimes even an incidental finding then we present three different assessment tools the risk of malignancy index the RMI the simple rules based on ultrasound scan and the so-called IOTA at next model. And then I will finish with conclusions and take home messages for you. The differential diagnosis of uh, pelvic mass. Here we see a diagram and apart from uterus, fallopian tubes and ovaries, the gynecological structures, we have to be mindful that bowel and bladder uh, are also uh, located in the, in the pelvic area. So it's important in the differential diagnosis to, to be mindful of bowel and bladder issues. Gynecological, I will discriminate between ovarian, which is the key component of my lecture of today, but also you should be mindful of non-ovarian gynecological structures such as the fallopian or uterine tube and the uterus itself. If you go to the differential diagnosis non-gynecological, a peritoneal inclusion cyst is an option, diverticular abscess, appendicular abscess or tumor, inflammatory or malignant bowel disease, and even sometimes a pelvic kidney or pelvic cyst. Usually you will find um, pointers uh, when you take a thorough history. Gynecological non-ovarian mass. In the pelvis sometimes you can find the hydrosalpings, in particular after hysterectomy, a paraovarian cyst absolutely benign and no uh, indication to uh, do something about it at all. A torsion of the tube and the ovary, a very distinct uh, condition. It's very rare but it could be, in the, should be in your differential fallopian tube cancer and tubal ovarian abscess. Usually women present with pelvic pain, fever and a mass is palpable whilst inflammatory markers such as white cell count and CRP are increased. Um, uterine fibroids, um, uh, especially the subserous ones, could present as a pelvic mass and with local pressure. Let me make clear, this lecture is not about pregnancy, because if you're a little bit cynical, you could argue an, uh, a pregnancy is initially as well a growing pelvic mass. But important in clinical practice to always think about an, a, a pregnancy, an ectopic pregnancy, uh, I tell my students if a woman is more than 8 years of age and younger than 80, it's worthwhile to check the serum beta as a G level. Okay, let's now focus on the main theme of today, that's the differential diagnosis of a pelvic mass if it originates from the ovary. We have first simple or hemorrhagic physiolo physiological cysts, such as follicular cysts, which arise in the first part of the cycle, and the corpus luteum cyst, which is usually takes place after ovulation. An endometrioma is a collection of endometriosis, which actually 
um, sheds endometrium inside the ovary um, and builds up over time. Take a lutein cyst and then the last dot points will be what we'll be focusing on mainly today, benign, malignant or borderline neoplasms, primary arising from um, the ovary, the primary tumors or metastatic carcinoma, secondary tumors. The most common metastases are from the breast, the colon and the endometrium. Let's go back one step, a diagram of the ovary, which is good to remind what the physiological function is of the ovary. The functional unit of the ovary is in fact the follicle, uh, which produces estradiol and eventually produces an egg once a month in a regular cycle. I refer to my separate video about the female human cycle. Um, Let's now look at the gynecological classification of ovarian tumors. First, we have a group, the so-called epithelial ovarian uh, tumors, which, uh, which represent 80% of all tumors. And the most infamous one is the serous epithelial ovarian cancer, which is a typical cancer which will be detected in stage 3, the silent killer. But we have a few others. Then we have so-called sex cord stromal tumors. Um, um, we see them listed here. Then the third group is germ cell tumors with a, a, a subdivision of uh, five other options. And then the metastatic tumors, um, 10 to 20 percent of all. Um, the sex cord tumors usually produce, they produce either estradiol or androgens and in prepubertal girls, they will, it might result in early precocious puberty due to the estradiol or endogenization or feralization in adult women. Um, but that's outside the scope of my lecture. The embryonal cell carcinoma and the chorion carcinoma produce specifically beta HCG. Okay, uh, I assume that you're now sufficiently Im impressed. The differential diagnosis is very extensive, very complicated and that might um, actually discourage you to look further into this topic. That's why I would like to provide you with a simple tool and some guidance. What are options if we find out that a woman has a pelvic mass? There are basically three options. Firstly, if the mass of the cyst is benign, we could wait and observe and allow Mother Nature to do its healing work. And sometimes, if there's a benign cyst, we would like to remove it either laparoscopically, that's the preferred mode of procedure right now, or with a laparotomy if the mass is very big. If we think about cancer, then referring to a gynecological oncology center is most appropriate for the best and safest care possible. Okay, in case of an acute presentation um, that usually requires an operation and or medical management, for instance, a woman is hemodynamically unstable, that could be due to the rupture of an ovarian cyst intra-abdominally, and she is bleeding like comparable to an ectopic pregnancy. The first measure would be, of course, if she is hemodynamically unstable, to do the ABC, airway, breathing, circulation, and so forth and so on. And usually this case, this situation, requires urgent laparoscopy. If the lady presents with fever, signs of the systematic inflammatory response syndrome of even septis, then no delay, commence IV fluids and give triple antibiotics immediately, as we discussed already before in one of the videos about postnatal care. Then sometimes if a woman doesn't uh, uh, respond favorably to IV antibiotics for two or three days, then sometimes surgical drainage is indicated if we're dealing with a thick-walled tubo ovarian abscess. Analgesia is of course uh, paramount as well. I would like to refer to the green top guidelines from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in London, the, um, the guideline number 62, which is, it gives us a great overview how to manage suspected ovarian masses in premenopausal women. In a woman with a small less than 50 millimeters in diameter, simple ovarian cyst. Simple means unilocular, just one chamber, 
generally do not require follow-up. Leave them alone. Very likely you're dealing with a physiological cyst. This cyst will most likely resolve within three menstrual cycles and important explanation and re reassurance is, uh, uh, is uh, important to, to uh, uh, make the woman understand that, she not, that we're not dealing with a malignancy. If the cyst sim is simple and measures between 50 and 70 millimeters in diameter, then an ultrasound scan initially yearly is uh, recommended. And if everything is stable and static, we can discontinue with that. If, however, the cyst is more than 70 millimeters in diameter, that, then uh, the recommendation is to uh, consider further imaging, such as MRI, or offer surgery, and that can be laparoscopic. Good. Let me give you an example of a transvaginal ultrasound scan, where we, this is a transvaginal ultrasound scan, and we see here uh, a unilocular cyst, black, fluid, uh, a clear increased echogenicity here, and the measurements, if you add it all up, the average size of this cyst is 42 millimeters, so that means the management should be explanation reassurance and even uh, maybe offer some analgesia and please leave a no, no operation. Another example of a frequent cause for unilateral pelvic pain is a so-called ovarian cyst accident. Here we see an ultrasound scan and this is the picture of the, the cyst and we now we see this typical appearance um, it's somewhat reticular, some people describe it as cobweb, but this is a typical experience of a fresh bleeding within an um, ovarian cyst after ovulation. So this is called a hemorrhagic corpus luteum cyst. So typical appearance um, and here again, important to explain this, I usually refer to a bruised ovary, reassure the woman, explain to her that it will take maybe 10 days to, uh, to Mother Nature to recover, to absorb the, uh, the little hematoma, offer analgesia and expected management. This is usually no reason to admit a woman. She can go home and uh, uh, expected management is most appropriate. As I explained before, it's important if women have symptoms, let's look at what symptoms might she present with. It could be pain, fever, increased abdominal girth, symptoms of pressure, abdominal, abnormal uterine bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, gastrointestinal symptoms, changed bowel habits, frequent stools or bloodstained stools, bladder symptoms and in particularly a mass can result in urinary retention because of the urethra is kinked off due to the pressure. Take a thorough history, because that will give you pointers in what particular track the problem might be. Of course, paramount that you follow this sequence religiously in case of an OSCE exam to impress the examiner. Examination, always start with the general observation and the vitals. Then examination of the abdomen. Is the mass palpable? What is the size? How does it feel like? Is the surface smooth or irregular? Is it mobile or not? Are the signs and symptoms of ascites? Is the palpation tender? Are the signs of peritonism, such as rebound tendonism? Rebound tendon, tenderness. What about the bowel sounds? Are we dealing maybe with a bowel issue? Speculum and bimanual examination should complement our examination. And again, in an OSCE, always follow this sequence um, if not, you might have missed that the lady is anemic or hemodynamically unstable. What if the woman has hardly any symptoms or we are dealing with an incidental finding, which is quite common in my practice. Women have an ultrasound scan, an MRI or CT scan for other reasons, and incidental, they find a pelvic mass which warrants a referral to us. Okay. It's clear, it's quite complicated, so you need some help. I need some help in daily practice as well. So ideally, I would like to have a simple, reliable tool to guide me. Okay, let's look at, is there, what is the evidence 
uh, what tool is available and which one is the preferred one. At this stage, we have three ovarian mass cyst assessment tools available. Initially, the RMI was uh, published, the risk of malignancy index in 1990 already. Then uh, more recently, we have a group of um, European Gynecological Oncology Centers, the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Group, IOTA. They came up with the simple rules, SR, and also with the so-called IOTA at next model, LR2. It sounds almost like we're looking at a flashbang new race car, but that's not the case. Let me first explain to you the details of the risk of malignancy index. The risk of malignancy index gives us an estimate of the risk of dealing with an ovarian cancer for a woman presenting with an indexal mass. What does the RMI take into consideration? Three things. One, is the woman postmenopausal or not? There are a few grayscale ultrasound characteristics. Grayscale means ultrasound Doppler, color Doppler is not included. And the third component is a serum CA125 value. CA125, the carcinogen antigen, is a glycoprotein or mucine, which um, is a marker for cancer. And uh, one of them is, of course, the epithelial cancer, but it's not very specific. The CA125 can also be increased when there is pelvic inflammatory disease or in case of endometriosis. But anyway. The RMI1 score, that's the original one, uh, is calculated by multiplying the, um, the ultrasound score with the menopausal score and the value of the CA125. Ultrasounds, there are um, five different features to consider. Is the cyst multilocular? Is there evidence of solid areas? Evidence of metastases? Present of ascites? and is the lesion bilateral. Um, if there are more, at least two or more of these features, the ultrasound score will be th three. But don't panic, I'll show later on that we have a simple calculator on the, um, on the internet uh, and that helps us. So don't learn it by heart. Menopausal status, yes or no. Uh, no gives one point and yes gives three points the absolute value of the CA125. So three parts are considered to calculate the score. Here is an example of a transvaginal scan and we see here um, visualized um, at least four or five different uh, follicles, uh, fluid filled spaces with a thin septum. Here on the right hand side we see uh, what I mean by a solid component, this is the cyst, and within the cyst we see solid parts. So that would be, consider, uh, would be considered here. Um, the RMI calculator is available online. You see the URL here. And this is an example of the page you will see with all the different uh, parameters. And you have to answer with a yes or no, and you give the absolute value for the CA125. And the and then the answer will be whether the tumor is malignant or not, most likely. Here is an example, by the way, of the test characteristics in the original publication by Jacobs in 1990. By the way, based on just 143 women in London, um, the sensitivity was 85% or 85, and the specificity was 97, which is not bad for a diagnostic test. Later in, 90, in 2009, Geomini um, included a few more patients and came with a sensitivity of 78 and a specificity of 87%. So um, slightly worse, but still not bad for a screening test, I would think. Um, the RMI over time has been challenged. People came up with different versions, RMI 2, 3 and 4. But so far, the RMI is still number one. The second um, tool we could use, the so-called IO, so IOTA simple rules. This, um, here they use only ultrasound criteria and 
we are, when we assess the ultrasound scans, we are looking for possible malignant and benign features, five of each. This, uh, the simple rule, does not include CA125 levels or the menopausal state of the woman or her age. Here an example of the malignant features in the top panel, irregular solid tumor, more than four papillary uh, projections, irregular multilocular tumor is more than 10 centimeters, and here quite vascular when doing an ultrasound scan. And here we see five examples of the benign criteria, just to illustrate. Uh, eventually, the simple rule tells us if there's one or more malignant features and no B features, the mass is classified as malignant. If there are only B features and no M features, it's benign. And if there are both B and M features, the result is inconclusive and the second test is recommended. Good. And the second test could mean you might add a CA-135 or you might do a diagnostic laparoscopy or refer to a gynae oncology center. So that's probably less clear. Let's go to the third uh, tool, that is the AOTA at next model. Uh, it's ask a few questions. Is, what is the age of the uh, woman involved? Are you working in the referral center for gynae oncology, yes or no? Then there are a number of gray scale ultrasound criteria, as we can see here. And last but not least, we add the CA125 level. Here you see the URL for the IOTA group at next model calculator, the questions you need to answer. This is an example, a 55-year-old lady, you're not in the gynae oncological center, the maximal diameter is 80 millimeters, the largest solid part is 3 millimeters, no more than 10 locals, and no papillary projections. Yes, there's acute shadows present. Acoustic shadows point more at a benign teratoma or a dermoid cyst, no ascites present, and the CA125 level is 14. Okay, if we do the maths, the results will show. Click Calculate, and here you see beautifully depicted, and also in numbers here, the chance that this lady has a benign tumor is 99.6%, and there's a very low risk of malignancy, and most likely, if there would be malignancy, it could be a stage 1 ovarian cancer or a borderline uh, malignancy. So, great, easy to use. If you would, by the way, for the same lady do the RMI1 score, then the RMI1 score would tell you that we're most likely dealing with a benign tumor with a total score of 126, which is less than the cutoff point used by Jacobs of 200. Okay, important. In case of doubt, if my tests are unequivocal or in doubt of the test, it's important that we repeat scan and the C125, for instance, after three months. If there is um, something brewing, we will find out, so to speak. So repeating the scan after three months will help us to improve all the test characteristics. In particular, the, the sensitivity will go up, the true positive rate will go up, and the true negative rate will be as low as possible. Okay. What of the three methods should we use? There's a great systematic review published in 2014 where uh, um, a back-to-back -back comparison took place of all these and even a few more. I added and I summarized for you here the in pre-monopausal women the RMI1 score, the simple rules from IOTA and the LR2 uh, score and here it's clear that the RMI sensitivity is somewhat disappointing. So the RMI1 is not very good at detection of malignancy in premenopausal women. By the way, these, this uh, analysis, this meta-analysis was based on 26,438 nexal masses, so impressive numbers. So quite valid, I would think. Now the right panel shows what is what are the test characteristics for women who are after the menopause? Well, you can see the sensitivity hovers between 0.79 and 0.94, and the specificity between 90%, so the RMI is here superior, uh, and 70 for the LR2. 
uh, I would like to show you a little bit of theoretic background here as well, the so-called receiver operating curves. For a diagnostic test, the ideal test, we should have a sensitivity of 100%, so all cases who have ovarian cancer will be detected by the test, and the false positive rate will be zero. If the test is negative, none of these women should have cancer. So the perfect test is represented by the red asterisk here in the left top corner. Let me now summarize a slide from the meta-analysis from Kaiser. And here we can see all the different uh, attempts have been done to improve the RMI1 score. Here we see the IOTA LR2 and the simple rules test as well. And you can see this uh, purple dot represents the IOTA LR2. Um, and so it means it's quite good. It's quite, it's in the left top corner. But none of these tests are perfect. That's why my recommendation in case of doubt, time should be used and to repeat the scan in the CA125 level. So impressively well researched area. Conclusion, pelvic mass. Extensive, non-gynecological and gynecological differential diagnosis. It's quite daunting. Clinical assessment, history and examination are as always important. Ultrasound scan is really better than apple pie. It's an essential imaging tool in women presenting with lower abdominal pain or pelvic pain. Much better than our fingers and our clinical skills. Two, conclusion, there are two new preoperative assessment tools after the, an original publication from Ian Jacobs in 1990, the IOTA Simple Rules and the IOTA Next Model um, Logistic Regression 2. In case of acute symptoms, usually surgery and a medical management is indicated. If a woman is asymptomatic, request a serum CA125 level, and I would think do the meds using the IOTA at next model calculator. It's evidence informed as we saw, and I'm convinced that Timmermans and his group in Belgium and in Europe will update this calculator if more information, moral evidence comes to hand. Um, this calculator gives an explicit risk percentage for different ovarian malignancies, as we saw, and it's very user-friendly for doctors, students, and also for the patient. I like to do the match together with the patient looking at the screen, and I give her a printout so she can um, use this information uh, to support her decision what to do. I trust that in the meantime, your confidence level has gone up. I hope you're not feeling invincible because then you would be like the male pe peacock I showed you before, a bit cocky. And that's a dangerous characteristic for a reliable and com uh, responsible doctor, doctor to be. Okay, unlike the robust Zen master Jimmy, there is no longer need to hide or shy away behind a mess. You should be confident now how to uh, assess and manage a pelvic mess. That concludes my Daroga video pelvic mass assessment and management and I will show you once more an overview of the references I used and I think are quite useful. Thank you.